So I don't know if it's 12 or 13 or where we are. It is, this is the, it's the, like those folks, we went to church with some folks one time and had a bunch of kids and that last little girl, they named Laston. That was her name. <laughs> no kid, L-A-S-T-O-N. That's all I know about this lesson. This is the last one. I don't know how many we did. <laughs> this is it. So uh, we'll give y'all a break uh, for a while. And I think we're all, somebody said we're all meeting in the auditorium next week and then start a new quarter. But it's, it's always an honor. And again, I, I, I know why they ask any of you guys that have done this. You know, the only reason they ask any of us is because they know we need it more than anybody. And we always learn more than anybody else from putting these together. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity. And, and uh, appreciate Dewey, Dewey asking. And, and Bill, again, thanks for all your help in uh, covering when, the times that I've had to be gone. I really appreciate that. And uh, to be wrong if I didn't think Elizabeth, I've got the best researcher in the whole world. I kicked, I kicked my coverage big time when I found her. But she <laughs> helps me find lots of things here that I, I wouldn't find otherwise. And so I'm very grateful and appreciate her help. Uh, before we get into this tonight, I'll ask you, if, if you ever, and I, you, you're bound to have done this, but has anybody got a, a situation like this you want to share where you recognize somebody strictly by their, you didn't know them, but you knew who they belonged to just by how they looked? Has anybody had that experience happen? You saw somebody. I'll give you an example. Elizabeth and I were at a choir concert when our boys were both here at LCU singing one night, we had not seen the choir that year, but we both sat down and we were looking up there. They started their first song and just almost at the same time we turned and looked at each other. I said, I don't know who that guy is on the top row up there, but I know Scott Johnson's his daddy. I went to school <laughs> with a boy here when we were in school, the guy's name was Scott Johnson. And I didn't know, I'd never seen that kid before, but I knew instantly that boy belonged to him. And sure enough, we talked to him after the concert, and that was him. Has anybody else had that happen to you? Or you recognize someone strictly off the, the tree they fell off of? Maybe you didn't know them, but, but you knew where they belonged. Anybody? I, I may have told you this in here. I, I've told it somewhere. I, I've told it often. I think this is even more remarkable is when you can tell who somebody's been around. We had an instance at Seminole one year. In the summer, we'd play seven on seven on Monday nights, and the surrounding schools would bring their teams over, and coaches would all just get out there and be the referees, and our kids would play seven on seven, just kind of pick up football. But it gave them a chance to work their skills and throw and catch and do all those things. Well, we invited the group from Lovington over one night. I knew they had a new coach. I'd never met him, never seen him. I didn't talk to him before we started. They got there a little late. We were already going, and I just, but I watched him interact. And two of my young coaches came up to me afterwards and said, Did, have you met the guy from Lovington yet? And I said, no, but I'm going to catch him before he leaves. And they said, do you know him? And I said, no, but I know where he's been. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, I guarantee you that kid coached at Arlington Martin with Bob, with Bob Yeager. And the, my, those two young coaches with me said, why do you say that? I said, because he acts just like him. And that was a compliment. Bob, Bob Wager's a great guy. He's very enthusiastic. He loves kids. And I've watched him do his thing. Well, sure enough, we catch this guy. And I introduce myself. He tells me his name, tells me his wife was from Lovington. That's how they got back out there. And I said, where did you come from before you came to Lovington? He said, I was at Arlington Martin with Bob Wager. And my two young coaches looked at me like, what are you doing? But and I told him, so I hope you take that as a compliment. I told my guys that's what had to be where you were from. And it's just because of who he is, you know. And I think the question is, would people recognize us being Christ followers just by watching us, you know? I'd always challenge our kids when we were coaching. I'd, I'd tell them all the time, I'd say, if somebody came in here today and the only person they watched in practice today was you, what would they leave and tell somebody about our program? You know, kind of the same way here. If somebody just followed you around this next week, you know, what would they say about Greenland? What would they say about Jesus? What would they say about us? You know, I think that's the, the challenge. And you said, why do you bring all that up? We think we start talking about the attributes of God. We all have attributes as well. And uh, people describe us certain ways. And that's my only hope and, and, uh, you know, prayer and going through all this is that just studying these things, maybe it 
makes us more conscious of the things we ought to ought to reflect and resemble as we walk as well. So that's what I hope. And then we'd kind of gotten to the end of where we had been on this series. And we've done, as I mentioned, have done this, had the privilege of doing this series several times. Elizabeth originally started in Olney in a women's class and uh, Elizabeth led a ladies class on Wednesday mornings there at the church in this study. And then I did it two or three times while we were in Frisco at the church of Christ in Plano where we were worshiping there uh, but Dermot Road. Um, and then I've done it Seminole, some other places. So we've been through this series several times, but we'd kind of gotten through where we were going to go. And then Sunday morning, we sat down in class and it's all of you did if you were here and we started Hebrews. Well, then all of a sudden there was something said that morning out of Hebrews that we both just kind of looked at each other like, well, that's it. It's the only thing that made sense to tie it all in together. And that is, of course, that it's, it's the attributes of God and the fact that it's the son, you know, Elizabeth, who's the guy, preacher you said always said that about the cross? You can't have a sermon if you don't. I think it was Brother Moser. Okay, she thinks as Casey Moser would say that you can't have a sermon if it doesn't have a cross, if it doesn't have the cross in it, you know. So that's that's the, the way it seems to us to be fitting to try to end this tonight in a way that all the things we've talked about as God's attributes are the things we see reflected in His Son and Scripture as well. And Jesus very much resembles His Father as. Uh, as I mentioned of that young man that we saw at the choir concert that night. So as we complete these lessons on attributes, we know we have only touched the tip of the iceberg. You know, it's uh, uh, we talk about that all the time in sports, too. I talk to it with our band directors, you know, it, not always take our kids to go watch the band. They only did that one contest every year in the fall. We'd always load up in the bus, and put our jerseys on. And we'd go sit in the stands and watch the band do their performance. We started doing that. Our kids kind of, like, what are we doing? I'd explain to them. You know, they just get this one chance. And <laughs> I've talked to many of those band directors. I think all you ever see of a band is that, that the tip of that iceberg. You have no idea what went into all that to get all those kids to be able to do that one little show, you know, and for those three or four minutes or whatever it may be. Same way with sports or anything we're into. You know, what people see if it's a public deal all they see is the very tip of what it really takes well that's kind of where this study's been we've just scratched the surface just seen the very very tip of the iceberg we could you could spend years studying this very subject and that's why guys like brother Mosier and, and uh, uh, pink and those guys have all uh, written books and done the studies they've had on it but there's no way we could teach or cover all that but as we looked at his attributes in small little increments uh it's just the immensity and the infinity of his immeasurable being. Uh, Zophar asked Job in Job chapter 11. He, Zophar asked Job in Job 11, verse 7 through 9, he said, can you discover the essence of God? That's what he asked. Can you discover the essence of God? Can you find out the perfection of the Almighty? Is it higher than the heavens? What can you do? Is it deeper than Sheol? What can you know? It, its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. You know, so we're not the only ones that realize that. They've, we've all known this for a long time. We're never going to know all there is to know about it. And I think that's what makes the Bible such a special book <laughs> is that you can read and study and go over and over and you're always going to find something new. Of course, we started this whole study with the answer to that, to Zophar's question and, and that verse from Romans chapter 1, verse 20, if you remember. Uh, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes and his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen because they understood through what has been made so that people, so that we are without excuse. And so that's the answer. It was the answer then, it's the answer now. Uh, he's, he's done what he's done and shows us himself if we'll just open our eyes and see that. Can, but, uh, I, can yes. I make a comment? You bet. And, and this Please isn't do. to put a focus on me, but it's to put a focus on what you're saying. We've been in Arizona for two months in an RV park. One of the Good fellas we've been around is uh, has Parkinson's. And I talk to him every day. He'd exercise and come over where I was. I do puzzles. And he'd come over there every day and, and we'd talk. And, and then Mike, my husband, he used this guy used to golf and 
So Mike took him out. For, there's a desert golf course behind the RV park. And he took him out. He could only go three holes, but you know, he, he wanted to try. You bet. And so when we before we left, this man says to, we, we were saying goodbye. He says, I just wanted to tell you both that you have shown such grace to me. And you know, the, he says, and I'm really attracted to that. He's not a not no. a religious man at all. Well, I made and, a mistake. And I said. You know, that's because we follow Jesus. Jesus is all about grace. You know, and I wish I could have said more. You I wish there was time. But but that shows what you're saying. Amen. You know, that those qualities that are, they can be seen, you know, in, in how we treat people. Absolutely. That's, and that, what a great story. You know, and I'm sure we've all had something like that happen to us, but it is. It's, a, it's his... His power, his grace, it, those things he gives us is something that can't be missed. You know, it, it's something we see. Elizabeth would always, we'd meet people, we're interviewing coaches and doing all those things or meeting folks as we went through the coaching circuit. And she, her very first, she always tell me, she says, they're, they're believers. I'm like, why don't you say, well, I can see it in their eyes. She'd always talk about that, you know. And very, very seldom, if ever, I, that I can remember what she not exactly right, you know, but there's a brightness, there's a light, there is a, there's something there that, that he gives us, and boy, what a great example, and again, that's just an example of what I said, we've got such opportunities, got so many opportunities every day, we'll just look for them, and sometimes it's not the big things, it's just the little things, it's just, <coughs> just being his hands and feet, uh, it's not breaking open the Bible and trying to beat somebody over the head with it, it's just being the person he would be, I appreciate and you sharing. People, people observe you if you're around them long enough. So I worked at the Buck Whale Center at uh, Dallas, and like I say, multiple people that I met. One day, one of these uh, animal hunters come and said, Where do you preach at? <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Yeah, and uh, you know. How about that? So they see you and they notice. I've noticed a lot of working a lot of the jobs, people that have a uh, rough language after a while, they mellow out. Absolutely. There. Absolutely. Elizabeth yeah. noticed that. We, we knew there were some college coaches that would come through and see us from time to time. And a couple of them were just guys I really, really admired, but they were known for having a, a very... Uh, Colorful, Colorful vocabulary. Yeah. But Elizabeth pointed out one time, she goes, you know, I've never heard him say a word around you or me. You know, she always loved it when he'd call the house because he was always so respectful to her and everything else. And here he is, this big time college coach, you know, but he always, and she always appreciated that. You know, people tell me that Larry Hayes had that effect on Coach Knight here. They say that Coach Knight was a different person when he was with, when he was with Coach Hayes. His language was different, you know, and so I think that's a, those are all great examples, and I appreciate you, appreciate you sharing. Uh, you know, we, we do have, we talked about this when we did that first lesson with creation. We, we tend to see it and stop a lot of times and miss the creator in the creation. We, we worship the creation. We celebrate the creation and forget to celebrate the one who made it. I told about the little poem that we read in poetry where they launched the rocket and everybody went crazy and then they're walking back out to their cars passing all the flowers growing up through the sidewalk and nobody even notices that. Well, that's much more of a miracle than that rocket. You know, we can explain that rocket, but uh, those things that he does each day, sometimes we miss, we forget to give him the credit. But fortunately, God sent his son and, and Jesus was the exact representation of himself. And uh, those are the things we want to look at briefly. Now. Before we get into this next section, how would you define glory? That was our uh, trivia question tonight, or our word of the day. And you had to write a definition. What would you write? Glory. Honor. Honor. With one, kind okay. of. God. God. I just think of God. Okay. Glory. Associate that word with God. I think of brightness. Brightness, beauty, beauty. Mm -hmm. brightness, beauty, majesty. Very good. I don't 
I'm not going anywhere with that necessarily, other than listen to how many times that word's used in this next passage. Because I mentioned that Sunday mornings when the light kind of came on with Elizabeth and I, as we heard, as we started our study in Hebrews, turn to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 3. Then we're going to jump over to 2 Corinthians. But just listen um, for that word glory in here. Um, Hebrews 1, verse 3, the sun, S-O-N, the sun, is the radiance of his glory and the representation of his essence. And he sustains all things by his powerful sword, word. And so when he had accomplished cleansing for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So again, the sun is the radiance of his glory. You want to talk about what you said about the, the sat down thing came up in class Sunday morning? Oh, it's just the priests always had to stand to give sacrifices daily. They stood and they had sacrifices. But when Jesus made his sacrifice, and he met when he sat down because everything was done. Uh, symbolic of it being, being finished. We are being transformed into that same glory. I said we go to 2 Corinthians 13. This is the passage. Just listen for that as we go through here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 7 through 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 through 17. But if the ministry that produced death, carved in letters on stone tablets, if that ministry came with glory, so that the Israelites could not keep their eyes fixed on the face of Moses because of the glory of his face. A glory which was made ineffective. How much more glorious will the ministry of the Spirit be? And we went back Sunday and looked, and y'all may have too in your Bible class. That it really does say that. If Moses came in, I'd forgotten that. He's glowing. So bright they can't look at it, you know. And uh, I think about the eclipses, you know, because they always, kids would get all excited at school. We'd all go outside, we're going to look at the eclipse. They had all those little tubes. First thing they'd tell them, don't look at the sun immediately. What are they all doing? Like a bunch of Pez dispensers, you know. <laughs> Our heads are just thrown back. They're staring right up at you like, no, 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 no. But you can't, you can't do that very long, right? It's just too bright. And that's what they said about Moses. For if there was glory in the ministry that produced condemnation, the law, that it, the law could only condemn. It didn't have any power to save. It could only show them where they were wrong. How much more does the ministry that produces righteousness excel in glory? For indeed, what had been glorious now has no glory because of the tremendously greater glory of what replaced it. Or if what was made ineffective came with glory, how much more has what remains come in glory. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we behave with great boldness. And not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from staring at the results of the glory that was made ineffective, but their minds were closed. For to this very day, the same veil remains when we hear the old covenant read. It has not been removed because only Christ, only in Christ is it taken away. But until this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is present, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, reflected the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another which is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So it tells us what we'll be like, you know? And it only makes sense that somebody can see, just like she was talking about in this example. Somebody can see, you're different. You're different. There should be, you know, it's that little song. That is the light of mine. It is. There's a light. There should be that light inside of us that, uh, that goes with us. And I, I don't know. I just think that's fascinating. And you see that over and over again. The glory, glory. Thoughts? Somebody stir up anything? Comments? 
Bill's here, so if you have a question, he can answer. But uh, <laughs> you got a thought or comment to share. All right, let's go. We'll keep moving then. So we'll go through nine of these things real quick. Some of the same things we've been through and just look at some scriptures to back those up. Jesus is the exact representation. We spent a lesson, I think, Bill, what he did on love. On love. We'll look at just a few scriptures here that back that up. Let's go to, uh, we'll start John 3, 16. You probably don't need to turn there. Just go ahead and turn to Philippians 2, 6 through 11. You, you wait for me over there. Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11. But the first part of John 3, 16 says what we all know. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And picking up in Philippians 2, 6 through 11. Who, as he already existed in the form of God. Again, looking at the fact that he's an exact representation. He already existed in the form of God. Did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason, also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The thing that jumps out, you know, I see you read stuff over and over. The thing that jumps out at me most here is when it says he, uh, verse 6, the very beginning of Philippians, who as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And he's part of the Trinity, you know. That just, you know, blows my mind. I remember when I was a kid, I heard Billy Graham say one time that he, he had no business getting into heaven. And I remember thinking, Billy, you can't get in. I am in trouble, brother. I remember thinking that, you know, I was a little kid, and I'm just like, oh, no, don't say that, you know. But I understand the more older I've gotten, I understand why he and everybody else, we all feel that way. You know, we know that uh, we're imperfect creatures. But uh, Christ knew what he's coming for, and he emptied himself anyway and came and did that. So, again, just, I don't know, exact representation of God's love. That's the only way you can explain what he did is a love that that we can't fully wrap our our brains around uh only love made jesus do what he did casting crowns i've read a lot of songs i told you a lot of music but but they've got a song called love made the first move and the lyrics in that song say from the throne to the manger and from a manger to the grave your cross is the proof that love made the first move from a grave meant to keep you to a stone rolled away, your cross is the proof that love made the first move. I think it's, uh, again, a love that, again, we're directly the exact representation of this Father, of God's love. Ephesians 2 backs this same thing up. You want to turn over there. Ephesians 2. We'll read verses 4 through 7. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7. Another very familiar passage. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the boundless riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 38 through 39. Follows that same thing. Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's one of those amen close the book places. Stop. It's hard to go on. How does that make you feel? Those verses have got me through the hardest days of my life. Heard Tim Tebow talking on Fox News this morning. So y'all may have heard him. He's got an organization. His foundation is working really, really hard with a lot of those Ukrainian people trying like crazy to help over there. They talked to the Fox News anchor asked him what caused him to start that foundation, be as committed as he is to it, and all those kind of things. Tim said he was on a trip to the Philippines and saw a child whose feet were on backwards. When the baby was born, his feet pointed the other way. Nobody in his community, in his tribe, wanted to touch him or be around him because they thought he was evil. They thought he was demon, you know, that was a demon possession, that kind of thing. And Tim just talked about how those men, those ministers that were in there with him, that he wouldn't do that, just the love they showed. And he said he knew that day that he had to be more, he had to be about something bigger than football or baseball or any of those other things. He excelled that so much. And he talked about, right there, on, that's, I appreciate him for that, he talked about just the love of, of the love of God, the love of Jesus, and then how we're all, you know, supposed to do that, and that's all that's motivating them to do what they're doing for those people over there. And I thought, man, that's just it's uh, it's it's inspiring to hear that it's it's still going on like it is. We all know that. Uh, second thing, so it's love. Yes, I've preached a lot of sermons in my time, and there's easy funerals and there's hard funerals, and. Uh, Almost without exception, when I come to a hard one, that, that verse and that passage of who shall separate us from the love of God, that, that one by itself got me through a lot of sermons that there, there wasn't anything real, you know, real joyful or upbeat about it. And, and that that passage is something we all cling to. Amen. So we see his love. Again, there's tons of scriptures we could read on that. We're just getting a few here to make our point tonight. Uh, so love. Second point, Jesus' exact representation of God as light. As light. Uh, if you know y'all, if y'all don't feel like that crazy Steve Harvey, that family feud, you know, you but if, if we ask 100 people, you know, we were going to do a family view question, we ask 100 people, their, two, their favorite time of the day, what do you think most people would say? Sunrise. Probably one of those two, right? Depending on where you are, if you're at the ocean, you know, maybe it's that sunset sitting out over there. But sunrise, man, it's hard to beat, isn't it? It's just... It's if you're not a morning person, you know, I don't see the sun. I don't know, maybe not, but I've seen a bunch of them because I've been up real early. So, uh, that would probably be mine is uh, sunrise. Well, why I say that, Henry Van Dyke said one time, the birth of Jesus is the sunrise of the Bible. That's what he said. Uh, after the birth of baby John, Zechariah made a prophecy about Jesus, and he knew a little something about this too. Luke 1, verses 78 and 79. Again, something we've all heard and read many times. Luke chapter 1, verses 78 and 79 confirms this. Because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us. The sunrise from on high will visit us. To shine on those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way of peace. That's cool. I, I guess that's cool. And he said that because he recognized what was happening. You know, I think that's awesome. 
almost like a flashlight. We're fixing to turn this light on in the darkness. Then God, then John testified himself that Jesus was that light in the first chapter of his gospel. If you go to John chapter 1, um, we'll look at verse 4 and verse 9 of John chapter 1. Again, he stays on this light theme. John 1, verse 4 and 9 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. This was the true light coming into the world, and it enlightens every person. You know, we say that. We, you know, we've all met those. We said they just light up the room when they come in, you know. Uh, I think as Christ followers, again, I think we all have some degree of that light uh, that is our duty to, to share with others. The echoes of the prophecy from Isaiah proclaim the coming of the Messiah. The same concept is used. You go to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. What you're doing Bible calisthenics, jumping from one side to the other. I understand that. But Isaiah 9, verse 2 says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And then if we jump down just a few more chapters, John, we were over there, John 8, verse 12 says, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Again, that's another amen scriptures. Mm -hmm. Comments, question about the light part of his <coughs> representation of God. One of my favorite verses is um, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. That is rich. Anybody else? Okay, one of our one week it was the whole it was holiness. Talking about God, an attribute of God is holiness. Well, Jesus is that exact representation of God's holiness as well. A couple of scriptures here to support that idea. Let's go to Hebrews uh, chapter seven, verse twenty-six. Hebrews seven, verse twenty-six. Jesus' exact representation of God's holiness. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. And it's one thing for an apostle or a believer to recognize that, but we know that in Mark, it's even confirmed that the unclean spirits recognized Jesus is holy, right? You go to Mark chapter 1, verse 23 through 24. Not just the good guys that see this and know this. The, the unclean spirits did as well. Mark 1, verses 23 through 24. Just then, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, notice his words, what business do you have with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That's pretty cool, too. And again, those verses go on and on. Somebody, anybody have one there that you want to share along those lines? Not will keep moving for the sake of time. Jesus is exact representation of God's eternal nature. This is another uh, topic we discussed as we went through our study. Jesus is exact representation of God's eternal nature. John 8. John 8. These are the I am's, right? John 8, 58. 
Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Right? Again, these are the kind of things that we know drove the Pharisees over the edge. If they would just, and if you want, I, I thought the chosen did a great job of Nicodemus talking, to, you know, and listening to Jesus, and those guys were just having a fit, saying, I can't believe that he's saying those things, you know, but Nicodemus knew there had to be something there, right? But these are the things that drove him crazy. Am is also, it, again, here's my English teacher. I, I did that for a while, but I wouldn't know this. This is straight from my researcher here. Am is also a, is a present progressive verb, okay? So these are flashbacks to all those junior high and high school English classes that drove everybody crazy, right? It's a present progressive verb, has no beginning or end. To being, it is eternal. Jesus eliminated his eternal attributes with the name of God as it guarantees its guarantee of deity and is a present progressive verb, which is also a guarantee of eternity. Because it's has no has no end, all right. Uh, and again, we we all know these examples. He says he he said, "I am the bread of life" in John six. I am. He said, "I am the light of the world" in John eight. He said, "I am the gate and the and the sheepfold." I'm the gate of the sheepfold in John ten. In John ten. He also said, "I am the good shepherd." He's, in John 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in John 15, I am the true vine. So everything he has he ever described himself, it always had that eternal perspective tied in with it. When you say, uh, say that, as he said it, is, uh, is present progressive. And so he was emphasizing the fact he was here, not just then, but forever. Comments, questions on the eternal part of Jesus' representation. Now let's look at his exact representation of God's immutable nature, his unchanging nature. Okay? This was one of the uh, Things we talked about, God's immutability is one of his attributes. Jesus represents that exactly. Hebrews, again, 13.8, uh, we're told that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Aren't those people, are those things hard for you to find in your life? There's just, there's just so few things that I can think of that they just, there's no, never any change. You know, but Jesus is, he's the same to yesterday and today and forever. And what a comfort that should be. He's got that immutable nature. He's also the exact representation of God's relationship to us as father, as brother. Okay. Uh, we told this in several different places. We'll look at three. Okay. Isaiah, going back over there, Isaiah 9, verse 6. It's an exact representation of the relationship that God designed, okay? It tells us in Isaiah 9, verse 6, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So a son is to be born but the name, the eternal Father, okay? Mighty God, Prince of Peace. Ephesians 2, uh, verses 19 through 22. Yeah, very familiar passage. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, and whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of 
God in the spirit. So again, that relationship, no longer strangers or foreigners, but your fellow citizens. Okay. And then also in Ephesians, uh, jump up one chapter, chapter one, verses three through six. Again, see that relationship factor here. Blessed is be the God and the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Here he comes. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, with which he favored us in the beloved. So again, relationship. Comments, questions there? Spirit, that was another topic for us uh, in this study. Jesus is the exact representation of God as spirit, all right, the Trinity. All right, Galatians 4, verse 6. We just learned about the, this last, those last few verses talking about the relationship. Well, here, here it comes. Galatians 4, 6 says, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Okay. Acts 10, verse 38. Acts 10, verse 38. It says, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Okay, Mark 1, verse 9. Again, here's, here's where, the, where it all changed. It in those days, Jesus from Nazareth and Galilee was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. And a voice came with, from the heavens, said, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. So again, that's the spot where we see all three of them. are here, hear God, see, see the Spirit and Jesus on the same spot. So Trinity all right there together. Questions, comments, concerns on, on the Trinity, the spirit aspect. Justice, we talked about justice and mercy, okay? And um, spent a couple of weeks looking at each of those. Jesus is the exact representation of God's justice and mercy. It's full of grace and truth. Look at a few of these. We're going to have to jump and get it all done here. Titus 3, verse 5. Titus 3, verse 5 tells us, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with His mercy. Well, because of us, strictly because of His mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus, the justice of God is revealed as making right this fallen world. Paul expands that vision in his letters to the churches. Uh, we see that in Ephesians uh, and Colossians. Let's see if I can get these right quick. Ephesians 1, 8 through 10 says, With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. As we said earlier, justice and mercy meet. They met at the cross. The justice of God could only be fulfilled in one way. We talked about that over and over. Death. Death for sin. But God is rich in mercy, and because of his great love, he found a way to shoulder that burden of redemption. And he sent his son to die in our place. So this simply is the gospel, that an incarnation, life, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and the return of Jesus Christ. God's justice prevails. The justice is integral to the, the justice is integral to the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ cannot be told or lived apart from this reality. Colossians 1, verses 19 and 20. 
Colossians 1, verses 19 to 20. It says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness, all his fullness, dwell in Christ. And through him to reconcile, reconcile to himself all things, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So again, he's the exact representation of uh, his justice and mercy. And then finally, the, the righteousness, okay? God made him who had no sin, right? First Corinthians 1 verse 30 tells us, but by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who came to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. By, but by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And then finally, first, second Corinthians 5.21 he made him to do no sin to be sent on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Amen.